So Dahlia gave me a tough assignment to discuss the limitations of guided growth, and there aren't very many, but I'll really elaborate on that. I use guided growth, as you probably can tell, in any age patient, any size, any diagnosis, any location, level, or direction that I can reach, multi-level, sometimes combined. The contraindications that we all know would be physiologic varus under the age of two, and physiologic varus valgus under the age of six, of course, skeletal maturity, or encroaching uh, maturity. They should have at least a year of growth remaining in order to expect any improvement. And if they have extensive physial damage, such as myelomeningococcemia, uh, then that may not work. This is a boy who presented age three, who had an awkward gait and some knee pain, but I felt this was probably physiologic and did not advise guided growth because of that. It turns out I was correct. He came back at age six, and the only reason he returned is that the insurance company refused to provide coverage because they said he had a pre-existing condition. So I wrote a letter to the insurance company so that he could qualify that this was not an orthopedic condition, this was normal growth. Another relative indication would be the so-called fat pie syndrome. He has a wide intramolecular distance and circumduction gait because he has large thighs. And at age eight, he weighs, 100 and, he weighs 75 kilograms. So he needs medical treatment and dietary consultation, but not eight plates. Uh, contrary, in contradistinction, this is a patient, this is not Blount's disease. The bony defect is further down. This is a fibrous cortical tether described at either end of the long bones, humerus, femur, tibia, and uh, is not well understood and is also not self-correcting. There are people who would wait and see. And of course, they're only one year old. I didn't rush into guided growth. But over time, this proved to be progressive and symptomatic with a shorter leg, in towing, tripping, and some knee laxity, and I knew it would not self-correct, so I offered guided growth. She did correct fully within a year, and I removed a screw for cutaneous removal. Noteworthy that her limb lengths equalized, her torsion resolved, as it so often does, the laxity resolved. The plate I will leave in place pending further growth and have left in place. Here she is a year after that, recently, almost five years old, no residual symptoms, complete remodeling of that tibial lesion, Wolf's Law. This is a nine-year-old girl with idiopathic genuvalgum who had no knee pain. She had a family history of genuvalgum, that's why they came. And I said, well, she'll probably need guided growth, but not at age nine without symptoms. She returned recently at age 10 without symptoms. It's not improving, it's not physiologic, I suggested maybe next year when she's 11 would be a good time so that sometimes they mature early in Utah and we don't want to wait too long. The reason they're on top of this is that her older sister had genuvalgum and she presented too late for guided growth. So she required uh, supracondylar osteotomies with lateral retinacular release. So they are well informed as to what the consequences are. This is a 13-year-old girl, avid basketball player with knee pain and patellar instability. And the sports people would discuss patellofemoral hypoplasia, maybe contemplate MPFL repair, etc. cetera. Uh, few people would recommend an osteotomy of the lateral condyle to deepen the sulcus. But in the big picture, she's got significant genuvalgum, idiopathic. She's 13 years old, but premenarchal, and I ascertained in a hand film that she probably had a year to grow. I didn't know if doing just the femur would be sufficient, so I did pangenu guided growth. In 10 months, she corrected to neutral, close to maturity, and I removed the hardware. Here's a picture pre-op, five months, 10 months. She kept playing basketball. Her patellas are stable. She never had NPFL repair, and I doubt she ever will. Interestingly, in the transverse plane, there's also improvement. The sulcus is deeper, perhaps not normal, but sufficient in her case to remain stable. And uh, so the benefits are not only in the coronal plane, and they're far more than cosmetic. 
This girl, on the other hand, has unilateral deformity, including excessive femoral anniversion, 30 degrees, 30 degrees of excessive outward tibial torsion, and genuvalgum. This is not compensatory for this. This is cumulative if you're the patella. She had, in my estimation, a year to grow, and my thought process was, I'm gonna break it down and try to correct the genuvalgum with guided growth first, then I can do a simple antegrade rod for rotational osteotomy and supramalleolar. So we tried that and she did not respond, perhaps because she had a history of uh, renal transplantation and some endocrine issues. In either case, after six months, she was no better. Her patella was still unstable. So I proceeded with a more complex rotational osteotomy, including correction of valgus and the supramalleolar osteotomy at the same time, and she's doing well. This girl with spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia has obvious genuverum that will progress. I started early with guided growth and persisted for years. At times, here's a loose screw, so I took it out and put in a long 3.5 screw. I would make a case, nowadays I would put longer screws where I can, not all the way to the cortex, but less chance of migration. In either case, here she is at age 10 after several years of waiting with an occasional plate reposition. And uh, later on, January 16, 11, she still had genuverum to the point where, and symptoms, so I did distal femoral osteotomies, one correction on the left, two, a second one required on the right. I left these plates in in the event, even though it's slow, that she would grow more. But about that time, we found that she had very little growth hormone, and she's not a candidate for growth hormone therapy. So the point, as Dr. McKenzie made, is if you don't grow, you won't get much correction. Here she is after her third osteotomy, just on the right side, using simpler technology, no more plates. Note how these screws have spread compared to the previous films. So uh, she's doing well. At age 13, she's 91 centimeters tall and 20 kilograms and uh, she's happy despite that. And what about obesity? Is this a contraindication? Is this a limitation of guided growth? Or do you need different hardware? BMI does not matter. It's fake news that you need larger implants in big patients, or that you need quad plates or stacked plates, stainless steel or solid screws. None of this is proven, even though it's hypothesized. So this patient is my personal best at 405 pounds. Our operating room table is rated for 350 pounds, so we put two tables together to do the surgery, and minor surgery straightened his legs, no osteotomies. And I would reason that if you could apply a strain gauge to this implant, you would detect very little strain. It's 24 seven for six, nine, 12, 15 months, undetectable, and that the plate, it's irrelevant what the BMI is. The, the strength of a three-year-old physis is probably more powerful than a 13-year-old physis. So you're not obligated to use larger hardware. And will it work for limb length inequality? The answer is yes. This is a patient who had idiopathic discrepancy, thought to be DDH at age one, but in fact it's an idiopathic shortening on the left and was monitored annually and at age six, still not ready. They moved to the West Coast and around age 12 had percutaneous drilling because it's definitive and there's no hardware and the proponents believe such, but he kept on growing and now this is his long leg. He has a five centimeter discrepancy in the opposite direction, having prematurely drilled the physes and committing him to probably a femoral lengthening unless they prefer a shortening. So therein lies the problem. If you can't adequately, accurately project growth Maybe you shouldn't use permanent technology. I use the same hardware for angle as length. The only difference being that there is a lag effect. If you put the screws in parallel for length, they often drift into some divergence, thus wasting a few months. So I put them in divergent in respect of that. And there is a two-year window for restricting length after which you should remove, by which you should remove metaphyseal screws, let them grow six months, and can reinsert. So intermittent guided growth is used to restrain a physis, um, removing the metaphyseal screws and waiting and reinserting. It's really a growth deceleration. It's not a growth arrest. 
This is a girl with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. I started at age three. She has gigantism on this side, did pangenu plates. Here's the arthrogram at the time. The predictions, even this nice multiplier convenient iPhone method, it's not the entire leg you're calculating, it's femur plus tibia. So remember, the foot in the pelvis may contribute to the ultimate discrepancy. Her foot is larger, as you can see here. But over the years, she had sequential guided growth, removing and reinserting pins, the vertical screw, and the broken teeth needle or Texas artifacts. She usually comes to Utah for surgery. But in spite of that, I removed the screw. The pin is not harmful. Monitor her growth. At age eight, her discrepancy is only 2.5 centimeters as opposed to 7.3 that it would have been 7.3. Yeah, so she would have been perhaps in a shoe lift with back pain and other issues, thus making you feel pressed to equalize the limb lengths. I actually think this changes the natural history of the discrepancy. At age nine, her discrepancy is three centimeters and she will return and repeat the process, inhibiting the gigantism and no major surgery. And finally, Olier's disease. This boy has unilateral discrepancy. Had I known him at this age, I would have put an eight plate here to neutralize the axis and optimize the growth here. But uh, he was observed over time and uh, almost age five before I met him with progressive discrepancy. And ultimately, at age almost seven, he was referred to me and, oh, he broke his femur in the interim and shortened him a bit more. At age seven, I started with the guided growth here and inhibited this side so that his ultimate discrepancy would be closer to uh, our ability to lengthen the leg safely. At age nine, he's, albeit slow, he's gradually improving. I had removed the metaphyseal screws and continue this process until recently. And uh, the goal from the outset was to avoid a frame, which has been successful. And note the, uh, you know, you can't see the physis, but you can tell by the divergence that you're still having some benefit. Peter, can you do that on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mr. Bowen's here? tables describe the form of endochondromatosis, which extends across the plexus. Yes. Yeah. And this is a beautiful example of recurrent varus, recurrent varus, it, recurrent varus. It's also an example of overcoming a cartilaginous tether. Yeah. yeah. No bony, there's no benefit to going in there and removing such a, it's, some of those are growth cells. I, that's a good point. And so uh, his discrepancy is 11 centimeters total, four on the four below the knee and seven in the femur. So just last month, I proceeded. He's now big enough to accept the 10.5 precise rod, which was inserted, and he's undergoing his lengthening presently. I left this in. You can't tell in this picture, but uh, this was left in place for the slight residual varus, um, and I'll, well, I may take that out or take the plate out when he reaches his length. So guided growth limitations are relatively few and readily managed, be vigilant and be creative and confident. Gracias.